In July 1994, astronomers all over the world held their breath as fragments of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 slammed into Jupiter. At impact, they were traveling at a speed of 36 miles per second, heating the atmosphere to about 30,000 degrees Celsius. These collisions shook astronomers to their core and proved that impacts can happen. One astronomer at the University of Hawaii wanted to give the world ample warning if we were going to be hit by a rogue asteroid. I applied to NASA for funding because of the dangerous asteroid aspect and they said no. And they said, they were encouraging, they said basically, this isn't a bad idea, maybe it's a little underscoped and so forth, maybe you ought to think about it, please resubmit. So that was uh, 2010. So I resubmitted and in 2011, after the second submission, they said no. But that was all to change when the sun rose over Chelyabinsk in central Russia. A near-Earth object had been spotted but it was going to miss the Earth by over 17,000 miles. So it came as a shocking surprise when a meteor was seen streaking through the morning sky. This was a meteor attack, the most powerful Russia had seen since 1908. But what exactly is a meteor? So the fragments of a, a meteor that actually survive entry into the atmosphere and make it to the Earth's surface, they're called meteorites. We categorize them into different groups based on what they're made of. So some are stony meteorites and they're made of, of mostly rock, some are iron meteorites, and they're made up of iron metal, iron nickel metal. And then there's some that have a hybrid, hybrid between rock and iron. This one is a chondrite. So this is what the meteorite would look like when we find it on the ground. So it has this black layer on the outside from the fireball entry into the atmosphere. On February 15th, a fairly large fragment of an asteroid, about 20 meters across, entered the Earth's atmosphere. 20 meters is pretty large compared to most of the material that normally hits the Earth, which is about the size of a grain of sand or a grain of rice. It produced a fireball in the sky that could be seen for hundreds of miles. That initial 20 meter body broke up pretty violently into thousands of pieces that were scattered across a, a city in the surrounding area, a city called Chelyabinsk in Russia. And that shockwave shattered lots of windows. While people were at their windows looking at the fireball, a few seconds later, the windows basically shattered in their face. And so it, um, a, about 1,500 people got injured because of that. This is fairly large compared to what normally hits the Earth, but also small when you think of um, there, are, there are millions of fragments of asteroids that are bigger than 20 meters. The Chelyabinsk meteor changed everything, literally bringing this problem down to Earth. 
And then what happened was um, the NASA budget got readjusted and the Near Earth Object Observation branch of NASA got a significant augmentation because the Congress was saying, hey, you know, this is really a problem. And so all of a sudden they had the latitude to really start thinking about taking on new programs as well as the ones they'd already been supporting. So the third time was the charm. We resubmitted and they said yes. And uh, that's what got us going. And so that the funding started at the beginning of this calendar year and we've been working like dogs for 11 months and making a lot of progress. So the asteroid terrestrial impact last alert system was put into place. The Atlas Project is a project funded by NASA to try to find killer asteroids. Asteroids are leftover rocks and chunks of ice from the early solar system. There's ones that are way out, way beyond the orbit of Pluto that are icy. There's an asteroid belt that lies between Mars and Jupiter. A lot of asteroids orbiting there, a lot of rocks. And then there's other ones distributed around. The ones that we care about are what are called near-Earth asteroids. And these are ones that are in orbits that uh, come near the Earth at some point or other and in principle could hit us. The idea is that if you have something that's going to hit us, it'll eventually get very bright and we'll see it. So the brightness of something or other depends on, first of all, how big it is, and also it depends on how far away it is. A rock of a given size will be fainter and fainter and fainter if it's farther and farther away. Conversely, a rock of a given size that's coming at us will get brighter and brighter and brighter. So the real trick is to come up with a sensitive enough system that it provides you with enough warning time that uh, you can do something about it. And so a little rock the size of a pea, I don't care about it. It's going to burn up in the atmosphere. But a rock that's coming in that's maybe, I don't know, you know, 100 meters big or something like that, that's a terrible multi-megaton explosion, I'd like to know about that way ahead of time so that I can say, hey, watch out, people, move out of the way. Even if we can't deflect it, at least knowing where and when it's going to hit is, is the goal of the Atlas project. 100 megatons, we're going to give you a week's warning. 1,000 megatons, we're This telescope is 20 centimeters in diameter. The actual telescope will be 50 centimeters in diameter. This guy's this long, the actual telescope is this long. So the thing that, that was actually the genesis of the whole Atlas project was the realization that it's a modest size that's required to give you modest warning. So it turns out that if you want a couple days warning or for a one megaton explosion you want a week's warning or something like that, it requires a telescope that's about a half meter in aperture. That big, that big, 500 pounds, it's, you know, a mighty big telescope by amateur standards, mighty big compared to a 35 millimeter camera and expensive, but very modest by, by uh, you know, professional standards and, and rather modest in terms of what it costs. What we'd like to do is to be able to provide 24-7 coverage of the night sky. And so, obviously, during a certain portion of the day, the Hawaiian island chain is underneath the sun. It's daytime. What we'd like to be able to do is put more units around the planet here and here, so that as the planet orbits, when it's daytime in Hawaii, maybe it's nighttime on mainland U.S. or nighttime in Greece or the Canary Islands or nighttime in India, and of course that gives us a view of the northern sky. We'd like to do the same thing in the southern sky and so what we'd like to do is put a telescope down here in Australia or New Zealand, one over here in Chile, and one over here in South Africa, let's say. And then with six units, let's say, in the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, we would pretty much have continuous coverage of the night sky. In 2022, the Atlas system expanded into the Southern Hemisphere. 
This is the Atlas Telescope being fitted into its dome at Sutherland, just north of Cape Town, South Africa. But there's a lot of near-Earth objects out there. And there is a surprising gap in the system anywhere in Europe. One man in rural Wales knows we have to find them all. A lot of people think this is science, when in fact it's not. If you want to do research into asteroids and comets, you look at a sample. Well, we've got to find them all. The Earth is the only place that we know for sure harbours life. And if this is the only place that harbours life, then it should be protected. 1994, big lumps of comet hit Jupiter, everybody saw it, then it seemed a reasonable question to ask what would happen if it was going to happen here. And just out of casual interest, I started looking to find out. And the more I looked, the less I found, and clearly there was nothing. In the US, they picked it up and ran with it. In the UK, there seems to be a sort of stunned silence in the corridors of power when you mention a problem that isn't likely to happen before the next general election. So without NASA, and without any help from the UK government, Jay started building his own Near Earth Object Observatory. The asteroid and comet impact hazard could potentially be the biggest catastrophe that the planet has faced in the last hundred million years. It's really rather reprehensible that at the moment only the United States is being left to sort it out. I find that unacceptable. But working on his own and unfunded might strangely give Jay an edge in solving this problem. Project Drax is to install a 24-inch Schmidt camera on site. It's a survey instrument designed to look at a very wide patch of sky. Unfortunately, we obviously don't have any funding to do that, but we have a splendid crew of volunteers who are basically doing all of the work. Nobody's ever done this before, so it's quite a long, slow process. The solar system's a flat disk, so you look along the plane of that disk. Unfortunately, there are other objects outside of that disk, much, much trickier to find. But if your funding depends on finding stuff, you're not going to look at the patches of sky where you probably won't find something. Since our funding is non-existent, we can look at those patches of sky. And when the Schmidt camera is up and running, I fully intend to do just that. An impact by an asteroid isn't a matter of if, it's a matter of when. You, I and everybody will thank the Atlas team and Jay for keeping their eyes on the sky.